What's been behind Daniel Jones's progress? What are the biggest concerns on this team? And the Giants and Jets held an uneventful joint practice. All that coming up on today's Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. This is Patricia Trena here with you. Happy to have you with us on this new edition of the Locked on Giants podcast. And today's show is brought to you in part by Brightco Jewelry and Watch Insurance. Brightco brings you comprehensive, fast, and affordable jewelry insurance for as low as $5 per month. Check out your special offer for Locked On listeners and get covered in under two minutes at bright.co forward slash Locked On. That's bright.co forward slash Locked On. All right. On today's podcast, we're going to take a look at Daniel Jones, who had another good practice in the joint practice against the Jets. Um, We're going to talk about his progress that he has made this summer. What's been behind the progress? And what does he still need to do to kind of continue making sure that he takes the next step? We're going to talk a little bit then about concerns still on the roster. Um, And then we're going to talk by wrapping things up about the Giants-Jets joint practice itself. So a lot to cover on today's program. As always, happy to have you with us. All right, let's kick things off. Daniel Jones's progress. Now, to start training camp, Daniel Jones as we all know, was up and down, um, specifically in the practices. There were days when he looked like he was sharp, and there were days when he looked like he didn't have a clue. And then there were some days where, quite honestly, we don't know if he looked sharp or didn't because we don't know what the instructions were to the quarterbacks. In other words, were there days where the coaching staff said, hey, we want you to purposely throw behind the receiver. We want you to purposely do this or do that so we could take a, you know, a look at um, what the defense can do. We don't know that for sure. All we know is that um, in watching Daniel Jones learn this offense, um, he's had to do it sometimes without his, his best receivers. You know, Kadarius Toney this summer has not practiced very often. Kenny Galladay has been up and down. Sterling Shepard is just now getting back in the mix. So there's been a lot of decisions and uh, learning that Daniel Jones has had to do on the fly. And you know what? The last few weeks, uh, Daniel Jones has really started to come together and show that he's getting a grasp of this offense. And I want to talk about some of the reasons why I think that is. Number one, you go back to the spring when they were developing this system. Brian Dable Mike Kafka, Shea Tierney, the quarterback's coach, they gave Daniel an ownership stake in this offense. In other words, they sat down with him. They said, Daniel, what do you like to do? What don't you like to do? And they took what he likes to do and they built it into the offense. They took what he doesn't like to do and maybe they tweaked it into something different or they just took it out of the offense altogether. So what did that lead to? Well, folks, that leads to a system that Daniel Jones can buy into because it's not Brian Dable's system. system. It's not uh, Mike Kafka's system. It's the Giants system. And when a quarterback has a system that he believes in, that he contributes to, that he feels that he can grasp, guess what? He's going to sink his teeth into it and he's going to really be able to execute. And we're starting to see that now, not just in the preseason games, but in the practices, everything's kind of catching up a little bit. So the arrow is definitely pointing up for Daniel Jones as he continues to learn uh, this offense and sink his teeth into it and become more and more comfortable in it. All right, what else do the, have the uh, Giants done to help Daniel Jones? Flexibility has been a big thing. You know, I mentioned the flexibility with keeping plays in that he likes and doesn't like. Well, they've also allowed him flexibility in terms of 
any given play. So for example, Daniel Jones has run a lot of RPOs. So if he doesn't like the look and, and he's supposed to originally pass and he thinks you know, that he could make better uh, production if he runs, he has that option. So in a way, I guess you could say some of the, um, the tethers have come off of him and they're trusting him to make the right decisions and be flexible enough with what he sees based on the personnel that he has on the field with him. And that, again, folks, is very big because, you know, you give a quarterback that kind of responsibility, nine times out of 10, that quarterback's going to run with it. They're going to flourish with it. And they're going to grow comfortable because they're going to start to see things the way they see it, as opposed to, oh my God, you know, we're supposed to run on this play. And I didn't think it was, you know, we should have run, but you know, the play called for us to run. No, they're giving Daniel the flexibility to decide what to do. And so far, for the most part, the decision-making has been on point. So that's another big thing. They are allowing the kid to relax. All right. Um, I go back to the last couple of years when it was drilled into Daniel Jones's head. Don't make a mistake. Don't turn the ball over. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, when you constantly have somebody in your ear say, don't do this, don't do that, you know, in that kind of tone, it's going to make you jittery. Dable and, and the coaches have taken the opposite approach. They say, okay, look, this is why we practice to figure out what's going to work what's not going to work, and what we need to change up. If we make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. That's why you practice. You know, ideally, they would like to have them not make any mistakes, but they also understand that mistakes are going to happen. And again, the time to work out the mistakes is in practice, not in the game. So that has allowed Daniel Jones, if you watch him, to be more at ease, more relaxed, more of that um, gunslinger that he can be. And it's made a difference in his demeanor and I think in some of his decision-making because he knows that if he makes a mistake, he's not going to go back to the huddle and have a coach screaming in his face. All right, a couple more things the Giants have done to help Daniel Jones getting the ball out of his hand quicker. You know, one of the big complaints with Daniel Jones that I've had, and it doesn't matter what system he's been asked to run, is that Daniel sometimes overthinks stuff post-snap. So by getting the ball out of his hands quickly and into the hands of the playmakers, well, now guess what? There's a better chance of the play succeeding. There's also a better chance or a lesser chance, I should say, of Daniel making a mistake. Gee, who'd have thought it, right? That getting the ball out of the quarterback's hand would, would help. Um, one final thing that the Giants have really done to help Daniel Jones, and um this is probably, I guess, up for debate. Some of you will disagree with this, but I think this is very important. I think the presence of Davis Webb and John Feliciano at center have been huge. And here's why. Davis Webb, as we know, came down from Buffalo where he knows the system. He learned the system that Brian Dable um, had up there, and he knows it as well as anybody. You can also make a case that Tyrod Taylor is familiar with the system as well, um, having played something similar out in uh, in Houston. So you could got you got to give uh, Taylor some credit there as well. All right. So having two quarterbacks that have run the same system in the past, they serve as a sounding board. It's a support system now for Daniel Jones when he has a question, when something's not making sense, or if he's not sure if he's reading something. So you can't underestimate that. Now, what does John Feliciano have to do with it? Well, Feliciano is the center on this team. He is the guy who is making the line calls, the protection calls, taking that off of Daniel's plate. You know, we talked about simplifying things for Daniel so until he can hit the ground running and really get it, get his teeth into this offense and 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 maybe get to level four as opposed to being at level two where he is right now. So Feliciano's presence has been a big one as well. So overall, folks, the Giants, both uh, up front and behind the scenes, have done things to help Daniel Jones get comfortable in this scheme. And he's responded. He's responded very well these last couple of weeks. He's looking um, comfortable. He's looking confident. 
He looks like he's ready to run this offense. Now, I get it. It's preseason. Daniel Jones to date has gone up against backups. Um, he hasn't faced any game planning. How's he going to look when things start coming in that are more complicated, more um, designed to be trickery, if you will? That remains to be seen. But um, I think overall, we've got to feel pretty good about where Daniel Jones is at this point in the summer, given what he has shown in both now the practices and in the preseason games. All right, coming up next, folks, we're going to talk about some really big concerns here. Um, not sure what's going to happen with these, these areas, but we're going to talk about it next, right after this. Hey, Giant fans. Okay, it's time for a true confession. I'm not a fan of keeping up with the Kardashians at all. But very recently, a very old YouTube clip of Kimmy K losing one of her $75,000 diamond earrings after being tossed into the ocean by an ex resonated with me. No, not because I own a pair of $75,000 diamond earrings, but I do have a simple pair of gemstone earrings that I inherited from my mother that if anything were to happen to them, I just might flip out the way that Kimmy K did. But here's the thing. The good folks over at Brightco make it easy and affordable to cover any jewelry loss that one might experience. All it takes is a couple of minutes to sign up, which you can do from the, your smartphone. And for about $5 a month, you get comprehensive coverage of your irreplaceable jewelry. So don't wait. Hit them up today at bright.co slash locked on to learn more or to secure your comprehensive coverage policy today. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I am Patricia Trena, and we're talking all things Giants. And on this segment, concerns. Is there ever going to be a year where we don't have much to be concerned about with this team? Probably not. Um, now, I've talked about some of these in the past, but let me just update some of these. The tight end position. The Giants added... Um, Tanner Hudson to their tight end room. But when you consider the three projected tight ends that will, you know, again, are projected to make this roster, Daniel Bellinger, Chris Myrick, and Hudson, we're talking 33 games amongst the three. It's not a lot of experience. And within that group, you know, is there really a solid blocker? Because I think the you know, the blocking aspect is what the Giants are going to really need from their tight end. Maybe the coaches have kind of held back a little bit on Bellinger this summer because they don't want to show, you know, tip their hand. But I just feel like that tight end group is really, you know, it, it, it's a concern for me on offense. Maybe a little bit more of a concern for me than, than believe it or not, the offensive line, which at least is starting to get healthy again. So um, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how that tight end group comes uh, falls into place. Now, Chris Myrick, interestingly, has been listed as a fullback slash H-back slash tight end. So it looks like he's going to play that role that, you know, we all thought Jeremiah Hall was going to play. And I'm not quite sure exactly how they're going to utilize the tight ends in terms of the passing game. Are they going to just be blockers? Are they going to send them out on pass uh, routes. I don't know the answer to that yet, but the lack of experience does concern me a little bit because, you know, it takes some learning to find that sweet spot in the seam, for example, to run up the seam and, and come up with a big yardage. So we'll have to see how that comes to fruition. Um, cornerback has been a, a problem or a concern, I should say. Um, this is nothing new. We've talked about this before. The Giants have you know, their starters with Aaron Robinson, Adore Jackson, Darnay Holmes. But it's scary if you think about it because they are one injury away from not knowing where to go from there. So, you know, Cordell Flott was, is a draft pick. Um, he's been making progress from his injury. Did a little work on uh, Thursday's practice, I believe. Um, but he's still a rookie. And he's missed a, a, a nice little chunk of time. Giants are going to have to add to this group. Now, I know they added, you know, uh, hand off of, off of waivers from, um, from the Vikings. But 
I can't help but think that their cornerback is, is still sitting on somebody's roster. And I think that's a position the Giants are going to go after heavily. Um, here's another uh, position that I've started to become this concerned with. Edge rusher. Blame this one on injury, folks. All right. So we've got Kayvon Thibodeau, who is missing time with um, a knee injury, a sprained MCL. He should be back at the latest by week two. That is, that's the, um, I guess, realistic target, although there's an outside chance he's ready to go by week one. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be week two personally, but we'll see. But now you have Aziz Ojulari, who in the practice against the Jets was spotted uh, after injuring his right foot. All right. Now, Ojulari is coming off that hamstring strain. I don't know it's, if what happened in, in practice is necessarily the same injury that kept him out, um, you know, or landed him on the NFI list. But if you don't have Ojulari and uh, Thibodeau for, for that week one game, Yikes. Now, I get it. Uh, Tennessee is more of a run-heavy team, so you'll want to adjust the personnel accordingly, and you might be able to get away with, you know, not having, uh, you know, your full arsenal of pass rush. But here's the other thing, folks. Ellerson Smith also has been banged up, and he had been having a really good camp, really good summer, suffered some kind of uh, foot injury, I think, and he hasn't been seen since. So, Depending on how these guys all test out. And as I record this, Ojulari was supposed to go for medical tests. So we don't know how long or what the extent of his injury is and how long he's going to be out. But could there be a scenario where the Giants are possibly without Ojulari, Thibodeau, Smith for, for a week or two or more? I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, that scares me, that thought. And, and given the luck or lack of that this team has had, wouldn't surprise me, folks. Not at all. So let's keep our fingers crossed for the best there because suddenly I think that uh, the edge rusher group is something I would be concerned about. Good thing it's a deep group. But, you know, a lot of young talent could potentially not be ready to start the season. And... Um, whether they're ready to, to, to play beyond that, that remains to be seen. But injuries, they're, they're just unbelievable. I, I, I can't believe what's going on with this team, with this, in, with this injury problem. And it doesn't matter if it's on grass or if it's on the stadium surface. The injury bug just refuses to let go of this team. And a lot of these injuries are, are just nature of the game. It's unfortunate, but here we are. All right, what other position am I concerned with? I still would like to know how inside linebacker is going to sort out. You know, um, after the team lost Darian Beavers, you know, who I think was was definitely the future, um, what's going to happen there? Now, Micah McFadden has played well this summer. Um, maybe not quite on the same level as Beavers, but McFadden can, can get the job done. Um, you know, I I think they're going to have Cam Brown. They're going to keep him, if for no other reason than special teams. And um, I wonder if Carter Coughlin might be on the bubble. That's going to be interesting to see. Uh, is Carter Coughlin going to be on the bubble? What's going to become of Tay Crowder, who is the incumbent? So I'm curious to see how that sorts out. And then finally, folks, we've got to talk about the wide receivers because that group has been hit again. So you've got Kenny Galladay, who has been practicing, but who's been quiet. Kadarius Toney has been um, limited with some kind of injury. Uh, we think it's a hamstring, but I don't think it's ever been confirmed that it was a hamstring. Um, you just lost Colin Johnson, who was going to make the roster. I can tell you that right now. Colin Johnson was going to make the roster. So now does that open up a spot for David Sills? Do they have room for an Alex Bachman who had a Victor Cruz-like breakout game against the Bengals? Do they keep Darius Slayton? Do they keep C.J. Board? You know, what do they do with that receiver spot? Do they maybe keep uh, Keelan Doss, who they initially cut, and then they pulled him back when they 
they move guys to IR. So a lot of uncertainty, I think, for the Giants at receiver, especially at the bottom of the depth chart. And uh, you can make the argument for the top of the depth chart too, because again, Kenny Galladay, for whatever reason, just has looked like a fish out of water so far with this offense. And that's concerning given what's, what's been invested in him. All right, coming up next, folks, the Giants and Jets did have their joint practice. It was an uneventful practice, but still, we're going to talk about it right after this. Hey, business owners, as you gear up for the fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find those people that you want to talk to faster and for free. Go on and create a free job posting in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring so that your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize whom you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So go ahead, post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. Patricia Trader here with you. And the New York Giants and New York Jets had their long-awaited joint practice on Thursday. It was held at the Quest Diagnostics Training Center on the grass. The team spread out amongst three different fields where you had the Giants' first-team offense versus the Jets' first-team defense. And you had short yardage work going on on another field. And then you had second team offense versus second team defense and stuff like that. So they spread it around uh, pretty well. And guess what, folks? There were no fights. I know some people are disappointed considering how 17 years ago, the Giants and Jets got into an all-out brawl uh, when they, tr they last held a joint practice. But as I said on the show yesterday, I don't understand why that was such a big deal, why that was such a story. A lot, you know, all the people that were associated with that fight 17 years ago have moved on. So why everybody was just, you know, licking their chops, thinking that, oh my God, we're going to have another fight, another series of fights. I, I don't get it. I really don't. It kind of, you know, goes against what the coaches wanted to do, which is basically give their players some quality snaps against different teams, you know, different faces and, and a different look. So, you know, mission was accomplished. Um, Brian Dable and Robert Sala, the Jets head coach, met and they established ground rules with their, their respective teams, which included no tackling, no putting guys on the ground. And the players, you know, stuck to that. And guess what? They had a productive practice. You know, the Giants were able to get in some quality snaps. So now it's going to be interesting to see, will Brian Dable pull the, you know, all the starters out um, against the Jets on Sunday when they play in the preseason finale. Salah has already said that he's planning on playing his starters. Okay, great. But does Dable say, you know what? We got quality reps in. We look good here. We didn't look good here. So we're going to pull some guys back and we're going to play others. Now Dable has that flexibility to do so. And that's really what this joint practice was all about. You know, Daniel Jones looked good. David Sills looked good. These are guys that are, you know, the Sillses of the world. Um, they're fighting for roster spots. And it was another opportunity for the coaches to evaluate them in sort of like a pseudo scrimmage, if you will. So, you know, just the, the, the practice itself, while uneventful, I think the coaches will probably sit there and say, that it was well worth the exercise. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Dable and, and uh, Sala both said at some point that they'd like to make it an annual occurrence. Well, you know what? If it continues to go down the way it did on Thursday, it's going to be an annual thing. 
you know, and that's really, really what it's all about. So those of you who are looking for a boxing match or a wrestling match, you know, unfortunately you're disappointed, I'm sure, but remember what the purpose of the, of the practice was, which is to get quality snaps in. So um, yeah, the Giants checking off what they needed to do. The Jets, I'm sure, checked off what they needed to do. Now all that remains is one more practice for the Giants and probably one more for the Jets. And then the game on Sunday. And then it's off to making the roster cuts. So we will uh, see how that all comes down because it's going to be interesting. Some tough decisions looming for the Giants that are being affected by both performance and by injury. So we'll have to see how, how that all plays into, um, comes into picture. So, all right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. Before I go, I almost forgot. My gosh, I should have said this at the beginning. Before I go, a lot of you asked me how I'm doing. Um, if you did not see the post over on, on YouTube, I have tested negative. Um, I no longer have COVID that I know of. And I say that because, you know, there's always a case of a rebound case, but I feel a lot better. Still not 100% with the voice, but I feel a lot better. I tested negative. Um, I'm going to test again over the weekend, make sure I'm negative. And the plan is to get back to work on site in East Rutherford next week. So I want to thank everybody who has sent good wishes, get well wishes and whatnot. I am on the men. Look, if cancer didn't get me, COVID sure as heck wasn't going to get me. And uh, I'm still here. I'm still here with you guys. And I'm thankful for that. So thank you for tuning in to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'll catch up with you again tomorrow.